Okay, maybe um, the three speakers could come up and um, we could take questions then and I could bring some chairs up here and we could grab another one. Are you okay? Is that good? Sure. Are you sitting here? Yeah, nothing. There you go. There you go. Okay. Can we also ask questions? You can? Okay. <laughs> um, do you want microphones? Do you all? Okay. Are there any questions to our three speakers? I have a question from Ms. Pinar. Yes. Um, you presented some models for some outlines of models that would reduce the price of rhino horn. Mm -hmm. Do you have an idea how low the price of rhino horn would have to go to make it, uh, un make it troublesome or uneconomic for a poacher to poach? That's an excellent question, and honestly, no, I don't know the answer to that. I think that's some of the research that really needs to be done. So we simply looked at what the price would be for these different market structures for game ranches, but we didn't look at whether that would drive the price down sufficiently that poaching would stop. But I definitely think that needs to be done. Mine also goes to Ms. Pina. You indicated on one of your slides that 24 of the respondents preferred not to say whether or not they had rhinos on their land. And I just wanted to know what could uh, be some of the reasons why they would not say if or not they have rhinos on their land, and also how would that help you uh, reach the objectives of your study? Okay, I'm just going to talk loudly and somebody raise their hand if you can't hear me. Um, okay, so the reason we gave that option in the survey was because to just ask people, okay, no, I'm going to use this apparently. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is that I can hear myself and it's disturbing on every level. <laughs> okay. So the reason we put that option of not prefer to say in is because asking that question, do you own rhinos, is incredibly sensitive. And the concern was that if we didn't give that option, people would just stop taking the survey at that point in time. Um, as to why they might prefer not to say, this is somewhat conjecture, but it's based on qualitative research that we did and interviews that we conducted with game ranchers and rhino owners before we implemented the survey. Um, concern about how the results would be used, concern that we were posing as researchers and actually were trying to locate rhinos in order to poach them ourselves. Um, so giving people the option to not say and protect their privacy was really why we put that in there. Um, it does make it a little difficult, I agree, in terms of if you're trying to test for statistical differences between rhino owners and non-owners, what do you do with that group of people? Um, but we wanted the data and data integrity more than trying to sort that issue out. Elizabeth, I just want to ask regarding the um, what we spent on conserving or protecting the rhinos. You stated that the security is 3.6 million and the management is 2.9 million. So it's close you know, so over six point uh, over six million per month. Is that correct? Across the rhino owners, yes. All together? All together. That okay, so what's it per, per owner? Um, that was up there. Uh, I would have to quickly flip through that slide. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, the median security, so we asked these as ranges because people would not give us the exact amount. The median for security was 50,000 to 100,000 rand per month per owner, and um, for the management costs, it was less than 50,000 rand per month per owner. That's the answer. Um, I guess this is mostly for the first two speakers, but. So as far as the private game reserve ownership, is there a lot of like diversity in the demographics of the owners and is there any possibility for collective ownership and could that address any of the poverty alleviation 
Or is it just too big in scope? We'll use the question for you. <laughs> for both of you, I guess. Okay. Sorry, then you just have to repeat on that. So now there are other questions. I was like, <laughs> somewhere else, but in the case, can you just repeat? Sorry, I was. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, you weren't listening to my question. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a rhino question, so. Uh, because yeah. I was at rhino questions, but in any case. That's okay. I was just wondering if there's, if there's really the possibility of collective ownership of the private game reserves or if it exists. Um, and if there is, could, that, could there be a way to use collective ownership to sort of address the poverty concerns that you were talking about? Or yes. is the scale just too big? No, when you say collective ownership, do you mean like locals versus uh, the current game farmers, or what, what do you mean? I, I guess, that, well, yeah, I guess sort of, but really just multiple parties owning a, a game reserve. Yes, maybe that, that happens, that happens. And in fact, um, we see where, where a lot of the farmers are starting to, to, to integrate their farms into bigger areas. That is happening more and more often. Uh, I think it's a, it's a good solution because by, by doing that, you obviously create a greater conservation areas, um, which is good for migration of, of animals. Uh, and I think from a, from, a, from a pure economic and tourism point of view, it's also uh, you know, a benefit. I, I think it makes much more sense. So it, it is starting to happen, yeah. Can I quickly pop my question to Elizabeth? <laughs> yes, you can ask. Okay, I just want to know, these 20 rhino uh, owners, how many rhinos do they own? What, what is the total? Do you have an idea? Uh, we pre-tested having that question in the survey and we took it out. Because as soon as people hit that question, they stopped taking the survey. They were concerned about stating how many rhinos they had on their land. There are questions one would always like to ask, and I wish we could have, but it was too politically sensitive. Thanks. Uh, so a question for Brian Jones, just around the, um, the wildlife corridors and the exploration of penguins for ecosystem services. So you mentioned that it was um, the idea is to get the wildlife corridor registered um, as, a, as a leasehold and then start to explore payments for ecosystem services. Do, do you believe that there's any other way to, to start to explore the PS schemes um, without having a, necessarily having a leasehold registered? Because as far as I understood, the zonation maps of the conservancy spoke already about the wildlife corridors. So wouldn't, wouldn't that be enough um, to start to look at getting, getting some payments together? Okay, it, it might be. But I think that the feeling was that people um, who would be helping to fund the, you know, making the payments would have a greater sense of security that the wildlife corridors were being maintained if there was that lease. Because no other right can be registered on top of another right. So if there's a right of leasehold, then um, people wouldn't be able to uh, register their customary rights in, in the corridor. Um, you know, some people might have the confidence in, in the conservancy, but the problem is that at the moment, a lot of it depends on the traditional authority and their strength and their integrity. If somebody's paying an Induna to allocate them land in a corridor, maybe the Induna will allocate the land, despite it being a corridor. What we've seen in the Sobby Conservancy is the traditional authority being very strong on not allowing people into the corridor. When I was up there, um, okay, in October, was it November last year, the Sobby and Dunas had just evicted people from the corridor. Um, so, you know, it, it, the leasehold would give a lot more security. Um, I also have a question for the third speaker, and Brian, is that right? Uh, and actually it deals with the slide that you have. Uh, did, do you, you didn't say anything specifically about roadkill in the corridors, especially associated with roads and traffic conditions, that type of thing. Could you make a comment on that? Yeah. Um, I haven't seen, I don't know if there's any work being done on it. I haven't seen a lot of roadkill in the times that I've driven up and down. 
but it does happen. Look, this is a major trucking route um, from Volfus Bay Port in Namibia um, to Zambia and perhaps beyond. And so you get big trucks coming down this main road and they do sometimes hit elephants. More in the National Park, which is just depending on where this was taken, either up the road or down the road. Um, but, and, and wild dog, um, sometimes uh, hit by vehicles in, in the National Park and could possibly happen along these main roads that uh, go through these corridors. <laughs> Thank you. My question goes to the first presenter. I'm now listening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. You gave, uh, as one of the key challenges facing game farming in South Africa, number one was poverty. I would like to know, is this poverty caused by the fact that the communities adjacent to these uh, game parks are not compensated because Possibly their crops are ravaged by the wild animals, or it is caused by something else. Because the reason I'm asking this is, I happen to work in a place in Uganda, uh, whereby the communities adjacent to the Gorilla Mountain Gorilla National Parks are not compensated, and that is the major cause of poverty. Yeah. And like uh, you find government partners, the government, everybody coming to address communities, telling them how lucky they are being located yeah. amidst gold. Yeah. So I ask myself, how can you tell people that they are amidst gold, but at the same time the catch word is, the communities adjacent to these places are very poor. Yeah. So in case it is a question of, comp of compensation, I would like to know how your country is going about it, because it's unfortunate in my country, compensation is not stated anywhere in the conservation laws. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, you see, it is exactly that, that problem, that there is no, no form of compensation, there is no direct benefit from, that they have from, from, from these national parks. Um, that on the one hand, but I mean, in general, the, the, I mean, these national parks are in rural areas and there's high levels of poverty in general. So, very few job opportunities. So what, what national parks have done is they've created this uh, section or a division that, that's called people in parks, and one of their functions is to educate and also try to develop skills uh, so that people can benefit. And also in terms of, of the policy uh, that, that people, locals should have businesses in national parks in different forms uh, and should generate money from, from that. So these are kind of uh, case that studies or, or attempts that they are trying to, to make to, to alleviate it. And I mean, I think that the problem is, is bigger than just that the National Park by itself won't be able to alleviate all the problems. Um, you, you need other forms of development, you need other economic uh, activities and, and that's the crucial thing. Um, and, and, and that's, a, I think, a bit, bit bigger problem to, to deal with. Can I ask Brian a question whilst I have the mic? <laughs> right. Yes, uh, just hold the mic there, sir. Yes. Okay, sorry. Yes, uh, uh, can you just take us through uh, publicity hunting again? If I got it right, you said publicity hunting. Can you just oh, yeah, no, it, it's it's the negative publicity. I mean, you are familiar with the uh, Cecil the Lion. If I just uh, say that name, then most people can relate to the stories and even the stuff that happened afterwards, um, where the media got hold of the story, and obviously the the the, the groups that are against hunting use this as a way to say, well, you see, that's what hunters do. Um, and it's not like this is happening every day. Um, so it's, a, it's an isolated case that has been put on the platform, and that's one story that hurt the hunting industry, and specifically the tofu hunting industry, more than any other story in the past. Uh, because everyone just grabbed onto this story, um, and it caused a lot, a lot of uh, problems. Uh, and negative publicity for the hunting industry. So, I mean, it's clear that the, the, the anti-hunting organizations want to stop hunting. And the way that they go about it is to tackle line hunting, first of all, because that's the easiest one. Because most people get very emotional about this thing. Um, 
and that's a problem. You know, from the, from, from the, the wildlife industry in general, we're not that well organized, like the NGOs that are against them. We're not. Uh, we don't respond to all the good stuff. We, we don't tell the world all the good stuff that is happening, all the jobs that are created and, and, and conservation value and the rest. And so I think, to a, to a, to a large extent, it, it's our own fault that we're in the situation that we're currently in. But it's happening here. Hi, um, I've got um, a couple of questions for Brian Jones. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work in Botswana on identifying corridors um, in the Mbango Panhandle area. Um, and I just wondered, in Botswana, um, you have to work um, a lot with the government because the, the government is essential to, to land allocation and stuff. So I just wanted to understand more how that works in Namibia. Um, was the government involved in any of this savages planning um, in the conservancy? And then my second question was, I, I saw that there, there's a lot of corridors um, being identified, and I wondered how big are they, you know, like what width are they, and have you thought about or done any work to, I think you mentioned that IRDNC tried to prioritise them, and I wondered how you've done that. Um, the way we did it in Botswana was based on the use of the pathways or the corridors, um, and therefore then the areas that you're, you're allocating are the ones that the elephants are most frequently using. And therefore, um, you're not trying to take up all the land for elephants. You've still got land available for, for people to have their fields and things. But the designated corridors are the ones that are being most utilized. So I just wanted to ask on that. Okay. So the first one on the government involvement. There hasn't really been direct government involvement. Um, essentially, the traditional authorities locally allocate land. That gets ratified by the land board, like the land board in Botswana. Um, but the land board hasn't really been involved in, in the work on the ground. Ministry of Environment and Tourism, uh, they, they were involved uh, with the uh, conservancies developing their zonation plans. And we, we keep the ministry uh, up to date on what we're doing and so on. But again, there hasn't been any direct involvement by the ministry. Uh, then the size of the corridors, it, it can really, uh, okay, close your eyes while I flip back quickly. No, sorry, wrong way. Um, sorry. I've gone wrong. Okay, don't worry. So the, the size of the corridors, some of them can be, I don't know, 100 meters. It's between the settlement there and settlement there. And the elephants are moving through at night. You go along the road, the main road in the dry season, you see the elephant paths, you see the damage, you see the dung. Go to the villages, you say, do elephants move through? They say yes. Um, when, you know, this time of the year, is it breeding herds, is it bulls? They can give you that information. Um, some might be a kilometer or two. Um, that Sobi corridor where we um, had the elephants, um, that's, that's a few k's uh, along the main road. Um, these here along this road, uh, as I say, maybe even 100 meters or something. Um, it can really vary. Uh, then how the prioritization, essentially, where, where, do we th where did we think at the time the most sort of movements were taking place? I mean, this is a very well established corridor. There's um, uh, Mike Chase in Botswana has collared elephants and they've been moving clearly through there. Um, there's a zebra migration from Makadi Kadi in Botswana um, down here in, um, all the way up through these corridors along the Chobe River in Namibia into these conservancies here. And so that was another prioritization because we, we had recently learned about that, that zebra migration. And, you know, everybody thought the zebra were coming just from the Chobe Park here. It was discovered it's actually a migration route. Um, they spend part of the year in Namibia and then go back. So those were the sorts of considerations. 
concept in economic research I think is important uh, to, to quantify this but also how does this benefit communities um, and then thirdly what is the conservation value of, of hunting um, because we know that if it was not for hunting South Africa would not have the amount of animals that we have now we know that um, so there is a conservation story to be told it's not the one that people want to hear they just want to get, you know, national parks are there and, 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 they are, and, and they're doing well. But a lot of activities are happening outside of national parks, which is important. I mean, it's the same issue with, with, the, with the work that, that Brian is, uh, uh, you know, doing. Um, there, there's a lot of stuff that's happening in private or in communal land that needs to be told as well. Um, so those are the things that we need to do. From our side, we are doing quite a lot of research on the, on the hunting Know, quantifying this but now they've changed the view because every time we go into a debate with them on in the media then they say well you always come with the economics tell us some other stuff you know so so now we're starting to move what is the social value of, of hunting because again there's, there's a lot of stuff to be told um, which we're quiet about our people who have been in a very rural area very poor were, were, were trained given the necessary skills to become a tracker and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, those things we need to talk about as well. Can I? Sorry. I'd just like to follow up on that because um, I think that's an excellent answer. Um, as you were asking that question, something that struck me, uh, well, obviously I live in the United States and I hear a lot of the rhetoric about hunting. I think that part of the problem is it's a very emotional issue, so sometimes science and data doesn't actually help you very well with that. I agree about the social perspective, and I think possibly one of the things that has been missed is that it's not being explained to people that they're not just hunting for a trophy, there's meat associated with that animal, it's providing food and food security. And so there's these issues of food security, about poverty alleviation and so on, that are equally emotional stories that could be told. Um, rather than just facts and figures about we have 20 million game on land, because that's not going to persuade somebody who thinks that hunting is barbaric, I don't think at least. Okay, I think we have one other question, one last question. Oh. My question is to the third speaker, Mr. Brian. Um, and you said there is um, a lot of uh, corridors in the Soviet Conservancy, and you said the main income from this wildlife or these corridors is trophy hunting. I wanted to know how does that affect the population of the elephants? Does it negatively affect it or does it positively affect it? Because you said there are a lot of people living around that area. Does the elephant population get higher such that it causes human wildlife conflict or what? <coughs> Yeah, so, so you're asking whether the fact that there's a corridor leads to increases in elephants um, leading to human wildlife conflict. Yes, and trophy hunting. Okay, the increase in elephants is, is part of the regional Kaza story. With 130,000 odd elephants in Botswana, a lot of them looking for some way to go perhaps. Re one of the reasons why Kaza looks at these wildlife dispersal areas. So that's really sort of driving um, the elephant numbers and, and increases. The corridors are, as I said, areas where the wildlife has always moved. The elephants have always moved through them. But because there is a, a growing human population, there's a growing elephant population, uh, there is also a growing predator population, the human-wildlife conflict is increasing. 
So that's why we're also looking at trying to integrate the different activities that are going on in the region with conservation agriculture, human wildlife conflict management um, in, in, in different ways and try and link that also to the uh, securing and maintenance of, of the corridors. Does that answer it sufficiently? Yes. Okay. okay I'd like to <coughs> thank our three speakers very much for um, your, your presentations as well as the great questions and answers that have come forward. Thank you very much. And um, it is lunchtime, and your lunches are going to be over at Safari Court, which is the tall hotel over there. Come back. The next session starts at 1 o'clock. And please keep asking questions as you go on through the day and the next three days. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.